Grüezi YouTubers, here is the guy with the Swiss accent again. In videos number 72 and number 76 we started to make invisible electrons somehow visible. There we dealt mainly with voltage. In this video we continue with measuring current. So let's start with a simple example. We use a 5 volt power bank and a 47 ohm resistor connected together. According Ohm's law, we would expect a current of 5 volts divided by 47 ohms equals 106 milliampere. Even if we assume that our thin wires add a few ohms, we should get more than 100 milliamp. So let's measure. The old-fashioned way to measure current is to use an analog meter. This works similar to an electromotor, which is pulled back with a spring. The more current, the stronger the force of the motor and the more amplitude is displayed until it is stopped by the spring. If we insert the instrument into the negative lead of our setup, it shows a little more than 100 mA, as expected. Let's now use more modern instruments. We take our multimeter, insert it into the same place and read the value. Very convenient. I have three multimeters. The first is a bench meter. It measures 96 mA. Now we try the UT71. It shows more current. So let's take the fluke. It shows even less current than the bench multimeter. So, what is the truth? And why do we get such big differences? If I would use very cheap and imprecise multimeters, we would have an excuse. Unfortunately, this is not the case. My multimeters were not cheap and are quite precise. So, there must be another reason. I take now the bench multimeter and change the lead from milliampere to ampere. Now I also get 100 milliampere with exactly the same multimeter. Strange. One general remark for today's video. I will not measure and calculate very precisely and will not use precision setups because we will only discuss effects big enough to be relevant for all hobbyists. We do not want to find the hair in the soup, as the saying is here in Switzerland. To get this problem sorted out, we have to know that multimeters do not measure current. They have a resistor between the two connectors and measure the voltage drop across it. And then they use Ohm's law to calculate the current. Let's simulate this setup. Instead of the multimeter, I connect a 1 ohm resistor and measure the voltage across it. It is 102 millivolt. According Ohm's law, the current is I equals U divided by R equals 102 milliampere, which is more or less what we measured before. If we would try to measure only 1 milliampere, the voltage would only be 1 millivolt and not so easy to be measured. If we would measure 1 ampere, the voltage would be 1 volt and very simple to be measured. In this case, we could even use a smaller resistor and would still be able to measure the voltage exactly. This is the reason behind the behavior of the bench multimeter. The resistor between the milliampere connector and COM is bigger than the resistor between the ampere connector and COM. Let's check if we are right. But how can we measure the inner resistance of our multimeters? We apply a constant current and measure the voltage across the two leads. If we use our bench meter and use the milliampere input, we measure 0.56 volts and about 105 milliampere. So the resistor is approximately 5 ohms. If we use the ampere input, we only measure 0.008 volt or 8 millivolt. This resistor is therefore only 0.1 ohms, much smaller. So if we use the milliampere range, we actually have 47 plus 6 equals 53 ohms and the current should be roughly 94 milliampere. In the case of the ampere range, 
the inner resistance of the multimeter is neglectable because the tolerance of the 47 ohm resistor is bigger than the 0.1 ohms. So we discovered the first rule. We always introduce an error if we measure current because of the inner resistance of our instrument. This has nothing to do with the precision of the instrument itself. So we best use the highest possible range of our multimeter. Sometimes this resistor is also called shunt resistor or just shunt. The name comes from our ancient ampermeter used at the beginning of this video. If we want to extend the range of this meter, we would have to shunt a part of the current with a small resistor. If I connect a 0.5 ohm resistor in parallel to the ampere meter, it only shows 50 milliampere. So its range is doubled. For higher current, also smaller shunt resistor values exist. We will use them when we deal with higher currents. But let's come back to our topic. We inserted our multimeter or our resistor into the negative supply lead. We can also insert it into the positive lead and do not see any difference because the current is exactly the same. And also the effect of our internal resistor is the same. We are now able to measure constant currents. In many applications, however, we do not have constant current. One example was video number 58, where we measured the current used by an ESP8266. There we discovered big current spikes. How can we measure variable currents? Again, the multimeter is not capable to do this. But we still have our oscilloscope, which helped us out last time. And together with what we learned before, we easily can replace the multimeter by the oscilloscope in the setup with a shunt resistor. We just measure the voltage across the resistor with the oscilloscope. Because we have two channels, we can use channel 1 to measure the voltage and channel 2 to measure current. Very convenient. So we connect one probe to the 47 ohm load and the other one across the shunt resistor. So channel 1 shows as expected a little more than 5 volt. But the other channel shows only about 20 millivolt. So it seems that nearly no current is flowing through the resistor, even if it's connected exactly as before. This cannot be. So we have to search somewhere else. Let's look at the probes of the oscilloscope. Each probe has an alligator clip for ground and a probe to clip on a lead. If we measure the resistance between the two alligator clips, we see or hear that they are connected together. Let's go back to our diagram and introduce this connection. We easily see that we short-circuited the shunt. So it is clear that we cannot measure any voltage across it. What we saw was just a measuring error. This problem is called ground loop and can be dangerous. If you assume that you use this setup with a resistor in the positive lead, you would short-circuit the load and a big current would flow through the oscilloscope probes. And this can easily destroy one of these parts if you have a powerful supply. Why didn't this happen with the multimeters? Because the multimeters run off batteries, they have no ground reference and are completely independent. A big advantage. So we discovered the second rule. Pay extremely attention to avoid ground loops. They destroy always your measuring results and sometimes even more. By the way, ground loops can exist also between different instruments like the oscilloscope and the spectrum analyzer or the signal generator because the earth wires are connected behind the scenes. It is always good to check your bench instruments and power supplies if ground is connected to earth. Summarized, we learned that the current is usually measured by introducing a shunt resistor in the circuit. The voltage measured across this resistor can easily be converted into a current reading. The smaller the shunt, the smaller the disturbing effect on our circuit. A small shunt also reduces the voltage and increases the requirements for its measuring. As we will see when we measure small currents, it also increases the vulnerability to noise. 
Basically, we can measure current on the ground or low side. We also can measure current on the side of VCC or the high side. This was the first possibility to measure current. It depended completely on Ohm's law. We can also measure current using a completely different physical law by using Hall sensors. A Hall sensor is capable to detect magnetic fields around the connector. A typical representative of this class is the clamp ampermeter. You just clamp it around one lead and it shows you the current flowing through this wire. If we look at its range, we see that it has no milliampere range, but ranges of 40 and 600 ampere. This explains also its inaccuracy in our measurements before. Its turf are high currents. These meters have three big advantages. First, because it does not introduce anything into the circuit, we have no errors because of shunt resistors. Second, because there is no connection to our circuit, we have no problems with ground loops. And third, they work for positive and negative currents. Apart from its inability to measure small currents, it has also another big disadvantage. It measures all kinds of magnetic fields. If I put the magnet close to its clamp, it shows big currents. This is why these instruments have a button to zero the effects of any existing magnet fields before measuring. Another well-known module uses this effect, the ACS712. Here we have a small chip which contains a cable loop and a hole sensor in one case. As with the clamp meter, they are isolated from each other. We get them in 5 ampere, in 20 and 30 ampere versions. Because they have to be inserted in the circuit, they are somehow similar to the shunt resistor, but they avoid the problem with the ground loops and can also be used on the high side without any problems. Their turf also is bigger currents. Today we dealt with some topics around measuring current in general. In the next video, I will concentrate on measuring small currents like sleep mode currents. And in a later video, I will concentrate on measuring higher currents, for example, currents of solar panels. I hope this video was useful or at least interesting for you. Bye!